All right. Um, morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day. Uh, so uh, this is Crashing Postgres for Fun and Laughs, and I'm Brian Faraday. Uh, normally, people begin with an about me, why you should listen to me. Uh, this is a talk about breaking things, so all the information you need is already there. I'm not going to give you my history or anything. I work at Crunchy Data, and I'm Brian Faraday. More importantly, the clicker is not working. Uh, more importantly is uh, who this talk is for. This talk is for anybody who's ever wondered, what happens when I hit that with a hammer? Does it keep running? You know, like the little kid hitting something with a hammer, wondering what's going to happen. Uh, so yeah, throughout this talk, I will take a virtual hammer and smash on Postgres. Uh, so first, background information. Um, these are the specs of the host I was running Postgres on. Uh, this might be useful if you're going to try to guess along, like, how is this going to break Postgres or something like that. So you can see the uh, six core processor AMD. This is my old trusty Linux desktop that I have lying around in my apartment. Um, 16 gigs of RAM. I gave it a 40 gig disk partition and uh, max stack, stack depth, shared buffers, uh, work map. That's all the default from Ubuntu. I didn't touch it. I just it's a Ubuntu machine. Just installed the package, created an init DB every single time, and moved along. Uh, so the first thing I decided to do was run this fun command right here. Uh, now, if anyone knows what this will do, uh, the truncate PG class, if you know what this does, shame on you, because really, you, you shouldn't know this at this point. Um, so this is the first thing I decided to start off with a bang. This is the first thing I ran, and the result, permission denied. So Postgres is awesome. You can't break it. See you later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, actually, there's a saying that uh, if you make something idiot-proof, someone will just make a better idiot. And that's where I came in. Uh, <laughs> so I figured I was dumber. Well, actually, let's start. Some people might not know what PG class is. Um, so when we talk about Postgres, we're talking about a relational database system. Um, PG class keeps track of the relations. Uh, it keeps track of anything with columns, basically, so tables, views, um, duh. materialized views, it even indexes. Uh, so it's a very important part of Postgres, because it's what puts the relational in the relational database. Uh, so anyway, I figured I was smarter than PG class, so I decided maybe I could run this command instead. And so this command did, in fact, run. <laughs> and it deleted all of the, I guess, how, what's that, 341? That's default just after init DB. That's how many things are in PG class. So I, I'm almost surprised the command completed, but it did. Uh, and actually, even funnier, I decided if, if it's still up, it hasn't crashed yet. Uh, what, what about a select one? Um, and it worked. So. Funny thing is, if you do this, you can actually sit there and use a bunch of math functions all day long, as long as they aren't touching a relationship. So you could do select one plus one, one times one, a bunch of that stuff still works. That is until you go to do something like this. And once you run this command, you'll get a fun little error message. Um, Server closed unexpectedly. I love the, at the bottom there, it's saying, uh, we'll attempt to reconnect. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, so funny thing is, actually, until this talk, that little symbol there, I, did, I actually had never seen that before. Because before this talk, I wasn't in the business of breaking Postgres. I was in the business of keeping it up. Uh, I don't know which business you guys are in, but uh, so, so I hadn't seen this before. So this symbol means that psql has, is no longer connected to a database at all. Um, you can't run any select. You can't do anything. Um, uh, so you can run a connect and give it basically all the stuff you need to connect, user, host name, host equals, username equals, and you could reconnect. But if you see that, it's probably just easier to exit out of psql, hit up arrow, and rerun to connect, rather than trying to type there. 
Um, so uh, I decided I might as well look in the logs, because yes, Postgres crashed. But I, I wanted to know why did Postgres crash? Uh, so also note, if you see panic in your logs, that means a server process, Postgres has crashed. It's gone at some point. Uh, if you've got it run as a service, it might have come back up. Um, and actually, uh, so the, the thing I love here, though, is that it says, could not open critical system index. Yes, apparently it was very, very critical. They actually mean that in this case. Uh, but the index number there is 2662, which uh, is actually a very special index. Uh, the name of that index is PG class OID index. So it's the thing that keeps track of all OIDs. Uh, the best part is it just lists the index number there. That's because if you look in the source for Postgres, you will find a macro somewhere that actually hard codes that uh, index, because that index 2662 will always be that same index. Um, yeah, so it, it will always hit that index if you are referencing that number. Um, so it, I love the server process aborted, terminating all other active connections. Um, but the funny thing is, it did kill Postmaster at the time, but Postgres did attempt to restart. It restarted the Postmaster. Um, but no backends could start. So I had a running Postmaster that was absolutely useless, which I just find funny. If, you, if, if that table's missing, I'm even surprised the Postmaster went, oh, I can do something. I would have expected that to completely mean Postgres wasn't even going to start anymore. But Postgres, interestingly enough, did attempt to start. Um, and the Postmaster thinks it's back up, but no backend starts. So you, you can't connect to it. You can't do anything with it. Um, and yeah, that, at that point, that database was completely useless to me. Uh, just wanted to say, don't hand out super user randomly to people, because you can't touch that table unless you're a super user. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, next thing I decided to do for fun was to set up a little replication loop. Um, I actually did this on two servers, or sorry, two clusters, still on that same server. Uh, I tried to set it up amongst one cluster, but it was a little bit hard. I'll cover that later. But so the setup I decided to do here was first I created a table. Um, table up, just an ID, int, primary key. Then I created a publication. Added the table to the publication. Uh, and then I created a subscription. So I ran this on both servers, but the replicate or the publication, the subscription, I just numbered differently on each server, uh, just for my ease. Doesn't really change anything for the fact here. Um, it created the slot. So I had a, a table. It was replicating between the two clusters. And then I ran this command on the first server. And on the second server, I jumped in and did table up. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with table, it's basically a short for select star from table, or from that table name. Um, it's a little convenient. Um, so I did this, and I got one, two, three, and that was it. So some of you may have caught why this happened. Uh, I, I jumped to the logs to see what was going on. And I got this. Duplicate key or duplicate key violates unique constraint a uh, primary key. I had made it a primary key because if you're doing replication, a uh, logical replication, you're gonna want a primary key on it. So that way you can identify updates and deletes using that value um, when it goes to the second server. Uh, so I figured all I had to do was drop that primary key constraint and reinsert my values. So on the first server, I just reinserted the values, went fine, and then I did a select count. And it was going up. 
So I was pretty happy with that. I, I waited around for a while, but it was kind of taking too long. And I'm very impatient, so I ran this. And this. And this. And, and, and that one. And yeah, I just kept hitting up arrow enter. And what I found was it was absolutely the most boring way to fill a disk I've ever seen. Um, it, it was just, it wasn't really, it didn't overload Postgres or anything, it just kept replicating. And eventually filled that 40 gig partition I had there. Um, and then went out because of that. Um, it wasn't really anything special. Um, just thought I'd, I, I thought it was gonna be more interesting. It just wasn't. Um, and actually, so Postgres doesn't really, there are a lot of things there to prevent you from doing circular replication, one being the primary key. Um, the other being that a lot of the, the tables involved, and when you're creating publications and subscriptions, it wants to get locks on those and then finish its transaction. And if something else has a lock on there, it will basically sit, sit there and won't create your publication subscription. So it's really hard to actually create on one server that loop because it has a lock on it generally. Um, and there's probably a way around that, but I didn't spend that much time since it was just easier to set up another cluster. Um, all right, so now we get into the fun. This is probably one of my favorite parts of this. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the copy program. Uh, so I just went into the docs and pulled this out. Uh, so there's, there's a key point here. Uh, copy2 takes the, uh, the output of whatever your statement was there and pipes it into standard out of a command. So copy program takes a shell command. Um, and it can be any shell command you would like. Uh, it's useful for processing data um, in a lot of ways. Uh, it, if you have to clean your data as you're transporting it out or like you want to replace uh, usernames or something, just wipe them out as they're coming, do things like that. The other important thing is it actually runs, it's just a child process. So it runs with the same permissions as the postmaster. So you, you, anything you run here is running as Postgres generally because it's a child process there. Um, so with that, the fun command I decided to come up with, well, so I did copy PG class because we've already referenced that. It was easier to use here and I didn't have to go over it. You can put anything you want there. You could put like a select one. You can do subselects. But if you put a table name, it puts the entire contents of that table into standard out of uh, this command is the one I decided to run. Uh, so you can see there the colon semicolon. Uh, that's actually something that just throws away standard in. Because um, I didn't really want the contents of PG class to go to the command I was running. Since, as you can see, the command I was running there is rm pg control. Uh, so with a name like pg control, you'd figure that it's very important. Um, so I ran the command, and it uh, tells the number of lines. but I was actually surprised it even completed again because it's called PG control. It's got to be really important, right? Um, turns out it's really not that important, I guess, because uh, I was able to create a table. I was able to insert values into this table. And I was able to select from this table. So who really cares about that PG control anyway? It doesn't, it obviously doesn't have useful information in it. Well, that is until this happens until you hit a checkpoint. Um, so I was kind of aware of this. So in order to cause a checkpoint, I just ran the command checkpoint. And as a result, the only thing you'll see is you'll be sent to the logs at that point. Like the command won't even return, server process crash, just like we saw up there where you get disconnected. Um, and checkpoint process aborted signal six, um, terminating all other active server processes. Uh, so. Uh, yep, back down to that, that little not, P SQL is not connected anymore. Um, so first off, what is PG control? Uh, it's apparently important. Uh, so PG control keeps a lot of your state of your database. Um, 
This is the, actually the only, well, there, I think there's one other reference in the docs about what PG control is. It's not covered that well, um, but the important thing is that it keeps your position in wall and what has been committed to the data directory. Um, so it's kind of important. And also the other thing is at the start of recovery, the server first reads this, then so this is why Postgres was dead and not able to recover. Is because when when I crashed the process or when I crashed the postmaster, it the service the service tried to restart, and it went oh the first thing I do is try to touch that PG control I can't do it, um, and so funny note uh, the, there was also in the docs that little thing at the bottom there to deal with the case where PG uh, control is corrupt we should do something. Uh, it has not been implemented yet, by the way. Uh, there's actually, it, it's funny though, because as the process is running, as the postmaster is running, most of what's in PG control is actually in memory. So you don't really, you need it to keep track of stuff, but it's already known to the postmaster. Um, but also, so while theoretically PG control is a weak spot, it's also less than one page, it's an 8K file. So it, it doesn't usually get corrupt. Um, but if you remove it, it obviously doesn't work anymore. Um, so uh, I wanted to see what would happen if I, in quotes, recovered this. So I decided to run this, this command here, pg reset wall, um, which you shouldn't really use. I'll go over that. Um, but uh, with the dash f for force, pointed it to my data directory, and I got this. Could not open the pg control file, could, I deleted it, of course, I couldn't open it. But I love how it suggests that I just touch the file and move on. Even though I gave it the dash, dash force, I feel like it should have done that for me. Um, although, probably not. Uh, so, um, yeah, also don't use PG reset wall. It will generally not do what you want, because it's just gonna update PG control to a new point, but it's not gonna, I don't even think it does any integrity checking of anything as far as I'm aware, it just updates data in PG control. Um, I would just restore backup. If you're in the case where you think you want to use PG reset wall, you probably just want to restore backup. Um, so anyway, I decided to follow directions and touch the PG control file. Uh, and then rerun the command, and it goes, hey, it doesn't, it doesn't have any data in it, but I'll do something, sure, why not? Uh, and then I started the cluster. And brilliant enough, it, in the logs I found this. It, it did restart, which was interesting because the next thing I tried to do was connect to it. And the database I was originally connected to was gone. And I was like, well, you know, that's okay. I'll just connect to Postgres. No, that was also gone. <laughs> it seems like the, when I reset the wall, I guess it reset to a point before initDB had really finished, and I had nothing in there, and that database was entirely useless. I'm not sure if reset wall made it worse or better at that point. I'd already basically lost everything. Um, but yeah, you probably should have a backup. Um, but PG, or sorry, copy program is still one of my uh, more interesting, f I call it fun. Um, some people might not call it as fun as I did. Um, because I, I actually had a case where I, I used I used the access uh, copy to copy program gave me because um, I had an appliance I had to uh, debug it was a third party appliance and I didn't actually have I couldn't SSH to the machine but I was allowed to connect as super user to the database and they were having uh, another team was having issues connecting to the uh, to the database, and I suspected that they were messing up the password. So what I decided to do was run this little fun thing right here. Um, and you should never run this, but uh, if you have super user, you can run this. So what this does is, again, the colon, semicolon, throws away standard in, uh, sed dash i, sed is a file editor, that is a command line file editor, uh, dash i is inline, uh, and what it's doing here is taking the first line of the file and setting it to be host all all trust. 
the thing you never want on your database because it just doesn't check any auth and just lets anyone in as whoever they say they are. Um, so this got me past the password issue there because I wrote that into my PGHBA conf. And uh, I was able to reload the cluster after that and found out that, yes, they were, in fact, corrupting the password because they were encoding it, decoding it, something they shouldn't have been doing. But um, that's, I, I've used it this way for fun. Another interesting thing that I've heard copy program used for is to start backups from inside the cluster. I've heard people use it that way. Kind of a cool use there. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, in summary, uh, copy program, be very careful because it runs with the same permissions as the user running the postmaster. Um, uh, nothing limits what you can put in copy program. Oh yeah, nothing limits it there. I, that's what, <laughs> yeah, there's a, a semicolon at the end of each line, and you could just write an entire thing there, and then you could send a bunch of stuff to a uh, file, compile it, and run it. You can, yeah, have fun. <laughs> um, I assume if you have transaction timeouts or something, will eventually kill it. I would assume, um, but there's. N Wait, no, if it's background, you're right. I don't know. I don't think so, because it's not actually like trying to run it directly through Bash. Okay. I, I don't believe it's going to work through any Bash. So you but can type in a and then you can type in I'm, I'm not certain, though, to be honest with you. We'll try it at the end of this. How's that? <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> it was, oh, God. Yeah. Um, oh shoot! I forgot that you guys didn't have a mic. Um, ah, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, back to uh, yeah. Nothing limits as we were just saying. The question was, can you background stuff and all that? Uh, nothing limits what can be run inside there, though. Uh, if you put it in the background, people think it may or may not run. We'll find out later. Um, Anyway, uh, you can do really cool. I, I, that's why I said it's fun, is because yeah, you could find that out. Um, uh, also, there is a don't hand out super user, but there is a utility that might help you prevent this. Um, it's an extension called PG Audit Set User, and it's pretty. It's kind of like sudo, but inside of Postgres. Uh, so you could you don't give anyone the credentials for the super user, but they can run set underscore user underscore s or u uh, to become a super user. If they are given permission to run that function, um, they can become the super user. But inside there, there are flags to limit things like alter system and uh, copy program. Uh, so if you have to give out super user that way, you can kind of prevent it uh, from going wrong. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh yeah, uh, sorry, I'm easily distracted. and. Uh, I found another fun use for copy to program, uh, or I found an interesting thing about copy to program and about PG control when I decided to run this command. So, for those of you that don't know, yes, um, by default, we'll just output Y and new line or return line, something like that. So, just Y enter, Y enter, Y enter um, at, until you kill it. That's, it just runs and runs and runs. Um, so I ran this command and, and let it run. And five and a half gigs of Ys later, there was nothing wrong with my database cluster. It was absolutely fine. So uh, PG control only cares about that first page of that file. And that's all it ever opens. So you can checkpoint after this. You, you, your cluster will be happy with gigs of Ys in there, and it just doesn't care. I just thought that was interesting that it, it also doesn't open PG control and truncate the rest of it. It just opens that first bit, deals with what it needs to, and, and rewrites just that part of the file. I just found that interesting. Um, sorry, uh, back to things. Um, the next thing I decided to do was uh, clean up these, these template databases. So if you've ever edited a new cluster, You'll notice that if you run 
slash Elden list your databases, um, you'll, you'll get three databases. But um, I don't really need these, I thought. Like, I, I don't care to have that many databases. Uh, so I figured, why not clean up this template one database? I'll get rid of these databases first, and then I'll create my databases, right? Um, so I tried to run this. And of course, again, because Postgres is awesome, it didn't let me. It says I can't drop a template database. Um, but I really wanted to drop this. <laughs> so I, I selected from uh, PG database the inf information I thought was relevant. And I got this. So there's the da database name if it's a template, and if it allows connections to it. Uh, and I figured, well, I, I need them to not be templates so I can drop them, right? And uh, I decided to run this command because it did what I needed. It updated them. And then I wanted to rerun my command. Can I drop it? Uh, and it worked. So now that I've got those pesky databases out of the way, uh, I decided to, uh, you know, create my own new database. And I got this error. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, so, I, there's a funny thing about Postgres. It doesn't actually create databases. It really, well, it's in quotes. You can run a create database, but it only copies databases. And template one is actually there to act as the default template. Um, that's just, if you run create database, there's actually an implied template one. You can create database with any template database. Um, you can pass it in as an argument to this command. And then we're back to good. I was able to, well, so I ran this command first to replace template one. And then the default commands started working again as soon as there was a template there. Uh, but I do like how they block you from dropping these by default. Um, also, template zero, you can't connect to it. Um, I, I'll go over why in a second. Um, yeah, so template one is there as a default. Template zero is there so you have a pristine database. Um, also, when you are creating from template, Nobody can be connected to the database you're using as a template. Um, otherwise, it won't let you create off that. Uh, so you can't just go, oh, I've got this really heavily used database. Let me just make another copy of it uh, while it's in use uh, it, to like scale or something. That, that just wouldn't work. Um, but yeah, the, the way I like to put it is, um, well, also, template one is there. You can modify it if you want some you know, defaults in every new database that's, that's created, just go ahead and you can put those in template one and you'll get them every time you create a new database. Um, you could also obviously create your own template direct, or databases uh, to create for different scenarios. But yeah, so template zero is there for, I like to say when you inevitably screw up template one. Um, but it's also there for other reasons to mostly keep a pristine database lying around. Um, yeah, so, so far, everything I've done has required super user uh, to do, which, of course, you can destroy the database as super user. Um, but what, what if you're not a super user? What, what can you do as non-super users? Uh, so I'm going to go back to the, the specs of my Linux box because they come into more play here. Um, so again, it's a 16 gig, 16 gigs of RAM, six cores running at uh, 3.2 gigahertz or three, three gigahertz, some, somewhere in there. Uh, 40 gig disk partition, and of course the defaults from Ubuntu because that's just what I took. Um, and I decided to run this little fun command here. Um, so this is a recursive CTE. Um, or common table expression. Uh, so what this command does here is uh, selects n from t, and t is defined up there inside the width. And what that does is it first starts with the value 1. It then selects from itself 1 plus 1. 
and then it would select from itself uh, 2 plus 1, and it would go and go and go. So this is the command I decided to run to crash Postgres, and uh, I had to wait, because this command takes a while. <laughs> but I did notice while I was waiting, there were two things that were happening that were interesting. Um, temp file usage was going up, because I had created enough data to get outside of work map. Um, and also, psql was going up. So I, I, I had a race here. I, I, I was wondering who would win. Um, some of you might have pretty good guesses. Uh, but 25 minutes later, I had my answer. And that was when psql died, which is kind of a cop out. Um, but also, funny thing is, um, psql died. I, I kind of cheated when I gave you the specs. I gave you the specs of the server. Not the fact that uh, I was running psql on a gig or a machine with 32 gigs of memory, and it filled that up before uh, before it filled up the temp files. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it was streaming data to the client the whole time, because if psql died, it must have been getting data. So Postgres was going, oh, I got some data for the client, 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 um, which is kind of cool that it's doing that, but it was also keeping temp files. Uh, so I, I needed to stop that if I wanted this command to work. So I, I came up with a better recursive CTE, um, and that's this one. Uh, so the big difference here is that select min n, uh, which is kind of funny because we, we know the answer to this just looking at this query. It's that one that's already hard coded up there, like that's the minimum number. Uh, you can tell that by looking at it. If we're always going up, if we're always adding one, we already have the min. Um, but in Postgres, CTEs have an optimization barrier on them where you can't really optimize from the query into it. Um, some people use that as a crutch, and I don't think that's going to change for quite some time because it's relied upon in some places by people. Um, so I started this command. And I waited. And got the boring integer out of range. Of course, I hit max int on a 64-bit system. Like, it was just adding to forever. And apparently, that didn't total up to 40 gigs of, of data. <sighs> so I, I got dumber, I mean smarter. Um, uh, I, I ran this one instead. Uh, this was actually kind of my favorite one of <laughs> select empty string, union it with empty string. I, I don't know if you can tell that's an empty string. But yeah, they're all empty strings. It might look like there's a space. But it's just empty string, union, empty string uh, un, un, until you don't return anything. And the select distinct there made sure it wasn't streaming anything to the client. It kept it all server side there. Um, so that way my client wouldn't crash. And I let this go. And I filled disk. And the result, what, I checked my disk usage, and I was at 1%. So the funny thing is it, it crashed the back end. Well, yeah, it, it killed the back end process. The process got basically, didn't necessarily kill it. Um, it just the query got aborted. And, and as a result, Postgres, when that query goes away, cleans up all of its temp, temp files. So I didn't really crash Postgres. Um, the Postmaster was still running. But the interesting thing is I was able to keep disk filled. So at least in theory, if I will, were to run a bunch of these and be writing at the same time, I could cause a checkpoint. Or I could be writing enough wall where as I have the disk filled, Postgres goes to write to wall, goes to a checkpoint. And if it has the disk filled then, Postgres would crash. Um, but I wasn't going to simulate that. That was very hard to do, because that's basically a race condition there of keeping the disk near enough. Uh, but yeah, so the interesting thing is I could have prevented this with uh, temp table spaces. Um, to, it's basically, you can say, a table space to create temp files into. Um, and you can put that table space on a different disk, its own, or a different partition, somewhere where it's limited and won't affect the rest of Postgres. Um, 
But also, I, I wanted to say that if you have untrusted users on your database, they can probably do stuff that will hurt. Uh, there's pretty much no preventing that. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. I am actually sped up quite a bit more than I expected. Sorry about that. Well, then we might have time to look at that. Uh, but also, uh, actually, any questions? Yes. Ah, yes. Yes, there's a lot of more abuses for this. Uh, when I had done a couple of the run-throughs, I made it a, a bit longer. I think I, I, I speak faster when I'm actually in front of people. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I thought I couldn't fit much more. Um, there was one, yeah, sorry. Oh, well, sorry. I forgot for the mic. Pass that back for questions. Hi. Huh. Is it on? OK, I can't hear it in my own head. Um, hey, I've got an Oracle background, so I've got a question on the wall. If it can't write the wall, does it crash or does it wait? Because in Oracle, it just waits until there's until there's until it can write. So, yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't say it crashes. It crashes sort of like you're not touching anybody. Yeah. I wouldn't say exactly crash because that sounds like more of an unintentional thing. It intentionally panics and stops. But yeah, if it's trying to extend a relation and it can't, it will wait. It will keep trying. Um, but if it can't write to wall, then it does panic. And that's it. OK. Any other questions? Well, then I think I'm going to go into my little fun thing that I ran um, previously. Uh, it's actually this little fun statement I, I found here. Well, uh, this was one of the other ones I ran. Um, I, I didn't think I'd have time for this. So what this does here is this finds all, I, I ran this inside of Postgres, and what this does here is find all of the files in your data directory. Puts them in random order, that's what Shuffle does, looks at the first one, and removes that file. This is actually a really funny command, because um, I think people would be surprised at the number uh, the numbers that result from it. Because uh, I ran this command a bunch just for fun. And when Postgres starts up, there's 900, if you do init DB, there's 900 some files there. Uh, if you run this command, what, well, I guess the, the question is, how many files do you think in that database directory are, are critical to Postgres running? The answer is somewhere around like five. <laughs> if you run this, there are m most of the files in that directory will be gone before this query stops running. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. No, I, I, I can run it later, but we do have to answer your question, I think, right now. OK. So now I can't see what I'm typing. <coughs> Class. Did that tab complete? Yes. To. What? Backspace? Yeah, I'm. Did I get the R in there? OK. Duh, duh, duh. What should I run in the background? What keeps running? Yes. Does that look right? Did I put a quote around that, or did I forget that? I got one there? OK, thank you. Um, OK.
Well, is it running? Ah, yes. <laughs> All right, I should probably kill that. <laughs> oh. What sorry, what was that? I will remember that. And now since my user won't have permission to do that. Oh. You're, in, you're in quote land in uh, SQL. Oh, shoot. Well, that should work. Semicolon's valid bash, so. Yay! <laughs> See why I said this one's fun? <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that covers it for me. Unless there are any more questions or. Uh, I guess I can copy paste that into there. We'll do it, right? Why not? Uh, I can't copy it from there. But I can tab over here. All right. Where is it? There it is. OK. I had the WC command down here, right? All right, so what's that say? 976. And while we're here, paste. Is that what that? Oh, that didn't work. Yep, you're right. So just cancel that. Paste. Is that actually the right one? Yes. OK. All right. So now we got the count. Enter. Oh, wait. Did it say? Child process. Exit. Oh, it already died. All right? What do we got there? Is it the same? 26. So just ran that command a bunch, made it down to 26 files before Postgres went, meh, I can't really do anything anymore. Um, ah, that's too much. This is way harder when you can't see anything. <laughs> but the funny thing is it's still running. Huh. Yes. Huh, it's still running. <laughs> I don't know why I killed the other command, but yeah. Anyway, all right, well, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. I'm, I guess I'm done here. <laughs>